everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this, uh, the 20th lecture in this year's 2016-17 uh, McLean Center series on reproductive ethics. Um, the series is jointly supported by the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, the Department of OBGYN here at the university, and the Buxbaum Institute. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Lori Freeman. Uh, Dr. Freeman is a sociologist at the University of uh, California at San Francisco. She's in the Department of OBGYN. She also teaches in the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley, is part of Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health, also known as ANSWER at UCSF, and also a Greenwall Scholar. Uh, Dr. Freeman received her BA at Oregon, at University of Oregon, and her, her PhD in Sociology at UC Davis. Dr. Freeman investigates the ways in which reproductive health care is shaped by our social structure and medical culture. In her book, Willing and Unable, Doctors, Constraints, and Abortion Care, um, she explores a qualitative study of the challenges to integrating abortion into physician practice. Unexpected findings from those physician interviews led her to research and write about the intersection of religion and health care, especially in Catholic institutions. Dr. Freeman examines how conscientious objection in medical practice operates in, at the institutional level. Dr. Freeman's talk today is entitled Women's Perspectives on Receiving Care at Religiously Affiliated Institutions. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Lori Freeman. Um, so today I would like to talk with you about patients' perspectives on and experiences with religious health care or more specifically Catholic health care. To be clear, when I say Catholic health care, I refer to the institutions, not individuals. Many research and write about the rights of individual professionals to refuse to provide services that conflict with their beliefs. However, individuals are legally protected from having to provide care that conflicts with their beliefs and must be accommodated by employers in most contexts. I'm particularly interested in institutions because um, that protection doesn't go both ways. That is, individuals, religious or not, must uphold religious policies where they work, usually as a term of employment or privileges. They are not free, due to their individual beliefs, to conscientiously provide standard care restricted by the institutions without consequences. So going further up the chain of command, so to speak, this research looks at the religious commitments of the institutional entities that override um, those of their employees and patients in the United States and what effects that can have on daily medical practice. Here's a glimpse of the roadmap of this talk. For background and context, I'll talk about what makes Catholic healthcare worth studying, how principalism can be used to frame ethical tensions, and in particular, how we came to be interested in the question of patient autonomy in Catholic institutions. Then I'll introduce you to two studies we've done, one qualitative and one national quantitative survey that displays patient understandings, awareness, knowledge, and preferences related to Catholic health care. After sharing the survey findings intermixed with patient stories from the qualitative data, we can discuss the broader implications together. Some have done studies to evaluate if the religious mission of the hospital enhances care in a meaningful way, and if so, how. Some do research about how religious clinicians navigate moral conflicts with care. I conduct much of my research in collaboration with Deborah Stolberg, Dr. Stolberg here at the University of Chicago, who spoke this um, last week in this series. And for some of, those, some of you who've been here or who were here last week, there might be some familiar background. But I'm going to go ahead and include the basics of what we need to understand this talk. Hmm. What we ask is, how do institutional religious policies um, restricting OBGYN care affect daily practice, and what does this mean for patients? Or more specifically, for women of reproductive age, toward whom a great portion of the religious policies are directed. Why the focus on Catholic healthcare specifically? 
Those in Dr. Stolberg's talk last week remember that she explained that Catholic the Catholic healthcare sector has been growing, whereas the presence of other religions um, in medicine has been shrinking. <clears throat> in this chart, you can see that um, Catholic hospitals between 2001 and 2016 increased nearly 8%, and during the same time period, the other religious hospitals decreased 38%. Um, secular nonprofits decreased 11%, and public hospitals decreased 34%. And the only hospital type that increased besides Catholic hospital was for profit hospitals. However, looking at the share of the market by hospitals is a big undercount. Another way to look at, um, and look at it is be, by portion of hospital beds. Catholic healthcare accounts for 16.6% of hospital beds in the United States, and that means that one in six patients will be treated in a Catholic hospital. Also, the difference in percentage may be due to um, undercounting Catholic hospitals that have been sold to non-Catholic networks but still operate under the directives. Catholic hospitals treat all women, not just Catholic women. But even Catholic women use contraception and abortion at similar rates to the rest of the population and don't necessarily want doctrine circumscribed care. Catholic hospitals, like most hospitals, receive public funding and pay for care, like most other hospitals, through private and public insurance and not church dollars. The employees and patients are diverse, and the hospitals tend to care for those who live near them and not necessarily those who share the faith. As you can see, the distribution of hospitals is pretty uneven, such that some states have more than 40% of their care operating under Catholic doctrine. The gray states have less than 20%, if you can't see the, the small writing. And 46 sole provider hospitals are Catholic, meaning that patients may have no other hospital in a reasonable distance that they can go to. Catholic healthcare t touches the lives of many people whether or not they intentionally seek it out, sometimes due to proximity, sometimes due to re reputation for care, and sometimes because of insurance constraints or because it's the only hospital in the area. Catholic healthcare really stands out from other kinds of religious healthcare for a variety of reasons. One is that it accounts for about 70% of all religious healthcare. And in contrast, the, the diverse group that makes up that remainder includes Jewish and a variety of Christian, a few other affiliations. Um, but Catholic hospital policies are relatively consistent, even if the on-the-ground implementation may vary slightly. They, may, they must adopt and practice by the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services, sometimes called the ERDs, or directives for short which are written by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and they're available online. Furthermore, while Christian hospitals are known to restrict abortion in certain circumstances based on their religion, Catholic policies are much more expansive, um, prohibiting abortion in all circumstances as well as sterilization, contraception, uh, fertility treatment, and other topics that can come up and you'll hear more about. Um, there are 72 directives, and if you're not familiar with Catholic doctrine on this topic, an overly simple explanation is that the policies in the directives derive from the central belief that sex is only morally legitimate when it occurs between a married man and woman with the intention of creating life in the process. Contraception and sterilization are seen as a violation of the integrity of this process. And facilitating the end of a pregnancy at any point, even during an already doomed pregnancy, is morally equated to a prohibited abortion, with some caveats, which I'll explain. Um, but it is important to understand that undergirding the directives related to abortion, miscarriage management, and even end-of-life care is the idea that no action should be taken to hasten the end of life, whether that life be a zygote, an elderly person, and everywhere between. So I know that some of you saw these last week, again, but I wanted to show you a few directives. Um, in case you weren't here, this is a basic one that says, 
all Catholic hospitals must follow the directives. Um, this is the directive about sterilization. Direct sterilization of either men or women, whether permanent or temporary, is not permitted in a Catholic healthcare institution. Procedures that induce sterility are permitted when the direct effect is the cure or alleviation of a present and serious pathology and simpler treatment is not available. So there's this kind of um, caveat. Abortion, that is the directly intended termination of pregnancy before viability or the directly intended destruction of a viable fetus is never permitted. Every procedure whose sole immediate effect is the termination of a pregnancy before viability is an abortion, which in its moral context includes the interval between conception and implantation of the embryo. So you can see the implications for some kinds of um, contraception or emergency contraception, at least the thoughts on those that, that still persist. Um, and this is a part of, the, of great interest to um, this area of work. Um, this is the caveat about what if a woman is at serious risk um, during a miscarriage or a pregnancy loss. And it says that you, she can be treated if, there's this, um, if you're treating the pathology. And so I, just, I included this part below, which is an interpretation, I think, in, in easier to access terms from an ethicist, Ron Hamill. Um, he says, ethically, if infection develops during pregnancy loss, um, Directive 47 provides guidance. Labor and delivery may be induced. This would constitute an indirect abortion because it fulfills the condition of the principle of double effect. So they're not trying to destroy the fetus, you're trying to deal with the infection, and if the fetus dies along the way, that's the, that's the acceptable uh, effect because of that, the pathology. So those are the directives. Um, so we can understand this in area of inquiry in many ways. Today I'll have us consider the highly utilized framework of principalism in bioethics, and we can start with um, beneficence and non-malfeasance. Are religious restrictions on reproductive health care helping patients? Are they harming patients? How about considering justice? Do these restrictions disproportionately affect disadvantaged groups, creating additional barriers to care? Very little research exists in this area so far. And finally, do they restrict patient autonomy? I'll return to autonomy later as that's the focus of this talk, but for now I just want to consider the top two in some detail, and I've made this handy chart. You don't have to read it all now. Um, the, or you can. Um, the, most the most common argument that religious restrictions are beneficial, unsurprisingly, is a religious one. Policies restricting reproductive health care protect women from having the option of services considered immoral within a religion, in this case, Catholicism. As such, contraception, abortion, fertility treatment, and the like are not viewed as part of health care, really, but rather something unnatural. At the level of the individual clinicians, religious, health, religious restrictions are valued for protecting them from being complicit in such care. And some theologians add an institutional dimension to this perspective. Dansel Maisy, a bioethicist and theologian based here until recently, argues that beyond being good for individuals, religious policies and religious institutions are good for society more broadly. They enable institutions, sorry, <laughs> they enable institutions to hold a protected moral space and to ensure that policies for the use of modern medical technologies are kept in line with religious mores. Institutional conscience rights are thus seen as a social good. There's much to unpack here, but for now I will just suggest that proponents of the argument that institutional restrictions on reproductive health care are beneficial are considering multiple levels that include the patient, the clinician, and the broader society and they are in agreement that the policies are keeping a certain kind of evil at bay. Those who argue that religious restrictions are harmful, and I will be transparent in locating myself here, typically believe that women 
do best when they can re determine their own reproductive trajectory. That women should be able to use safe and legal means to prevent or terminate pregnancy when they feel is necessary. From this perspective, contraception and abortion are not immoral. Bringing a child into the world is regarded a lifelong physical, financial, and emotional investment that only the pregnant woman can or should decide to make. Going a step further, depriving her of reproductive autonomy has negative effects for her sense of self-efficacy in the world, for her children's well-being, and for the larger society in that it re-stigmatizes family planning services that are so highly utilized and so critical for women's lives. At the clinician level, restrictions are viewed as an impediment to standard care that the patient wants and that the clinician has a duty to provide, or at least to help her find as a gatekeeper to the limited resource of health care. On the level of society, health services that enable women to control the timing and number of births that she has are considered a social good that promotes gender equity and a healthier society. Pretty basic ideas for this group, but it's important to get at the essence of the disagreement. The very restricted care is seen as the means to public health from one perspective and a kind of evil from another. You might notice that these different arguments don't really speak directly to each other. Perhaps they speak around each other. But they are logics reg regularly employed in the literature and in debate about family planning and the right to restrict care in religious facilities or even in debates about health care reform. Yet you can see these opposing perspectives differ at the level of one's entire worldview. And I just want to make a brief note about adoption, which is often brought up as the escape valve in this discussion, at least as an alternative to abortion. The truth is that the adoption rate is less than 1% of unintended pregnancies, whereas about half of unintended pregnancies end in abortion. Demonstrating that as much as adoption is widely discussed, it does not appear to be widely embraced by women in a position to make that decision. Even in the complex case of miscarriage, when that very decision to have a child is taken out of a woman's hands, research shows that having the ability to choose the course of treatment is critical to her well-being. Among the three options of miscarriage management, which you probably know are expectant, medical, and surgical, the most important predictor of satisfaction is having the right to make that decision and choice. For those of you not here last week, these, this relates because a woman miscarrying in a Catholic hospital may not have choices over um, care if the fetus hasn't died yet or if she hasn't become sick yet, n making it possible to justify the abortion or the DNC. Even if her membranes have ruptured and the pregnancy is determined to be over, Treatment to empty the uterus would be considered a prohibited abortion according to Catholic theology. Treatment's delayed until the fetus dies or it can be demonstrated to an ethics committee that her life is threatened by sepsis, hemorrhage, or a comparable threat. And I've included some examples from our research with physicians for background here, for those of you not at the talk last week, about how some physicians felt the directives harmed patients. One physician said, if you go to a secular hospital anywhere in the country with the complication of ruptured membranes, but say a normal baby at 20 weeks, you, a woman, would be offered Pitocin. That would be one of her options. In my hospital, I can't do that. So then I'm aware I'm not exactly practicing the standard of care from a non-Catholic hospital standpoint. As you can see, this physician characterizes the restriction as mandating care beneath the standard practice she'd learned before working there. Similarly, um, doctors frequently spoke about the directives as restricting what would be safest and most patient-centered. This doctor said, I think in a truly Catholic hospital, you just go there knowing you can't practice to the capacity you want, and thus it requires a patient to have another procedure, you know? If you're in the delivery room and you have a C-section and the tubes are right there, or the day after a vaginal delivery, the, t the uterus is up at your belly button, just make a little inc incision in the belly button and the tubes are right there. They're very easy to tie. Hmm. 
Furthermore, doctors were concerned about transparency. Some worried about whether patients understood um, the what the religious policies were or whether the hospital was Catholic. For example, one doctor said, I don't think my patients are aware there are restrictions. The only time that would come up if you is if you personally had that issue. Most of the time, I think it's a surprise, like when I tell them I can't have, they, they can't have a tubal. Another points out that patients likely don't know um, during pregnancy that there's a committee involved in the decision to treat. Um, the public isn't aware that if you come in with ruptured membranes, sorry, ruptured membranes at 20 weeks, that you do not have the option to terminate the pregnancy, that that's, not some, that that's something that has to go to committee. Typically, an ethics committee has a clergy member, a medical member, maybe an administrator. Take a little drink. So in light of physicians' concerns, we wondered, how well can women identify if their hospital is Catholic or what that might mean for care? While the names Mercy and Providence might be recognizable as Catholic to some, hospital names such as Lakewood, Peace Health, Dignity do not necessarily convey that care is religiously restricted. These two studies were interested in this question and were innovative in assessing the transparency of religious hospitals on care. In the first, Miriam Giahi's team randomized 236 women in Denver to um, two hospitals, one called St. Ignatius and the other called Metropolitan, and asked them what reproductive services they expected to find in their hospital. The majority of respondents in both groups expected to be able to get all of the reproductive health services, including the ability to end a pregnancy for any reason. And in another study, also by Miriam Giahi's team, the researchers analyzed Catholic hospital websites and found the, that none listed any restrictions on contraceptive services. Between what the physicians told us and what Giahi's research indicated, we wanted to dig deeper into this question of transparency about religious restrictions. We wanted to know to what extent women are aware of the religious um, affiliation of their healthcare informed by how, and how informed they are about how religious healthcare might differ and how able they are to access um, other care in a timely and dignified way. So, from after doing the physician interviews, we went on to um, conduct patient interviews and then a national survey. And in the summer, we will begin phase two of the patient interviews. And, and today, um, so and I'll just mention, mention that I also do, am doing ongoing interviews with ethicists who've worked in Catholic hospitals. And um, today, I'm going to focus on these two studies um, that Dr. Stolberg and I are working on. <clears throat> so in phase one, oh, sorry. Um, and I, I just want to also mention that we haven't published any results yet from the survey. It's really brand new. And so I'm just going to share some of the analyses we've done. So in phase one, um, we conducted 22 exploratory in-depth interviews with women who had experience seeking reproductive health care that is um, in Catholic facilities. And then we, um, we split the research into two phases because the first phase of qualitative interviews was helpful for informing the design of the survey. Um, but it wasn't resulting in a sample as diverse as we wanted. So we paused to allow the survey to take place. Um, and this summer, we're going to recruit from 881 survey respondents who said that they'd be fine with being recontacted for an interview. And we'll fill that sample out more completely. But today, I'm going to draw on the 22 respondents that we have from phase one and um, show how they can illustrate some of the survey results in a meaningful way. I won't go into the methods at length here, but feel free to ask me any questions after. So I'm a sociologist, as you know, and primarily a qualitative researcher. And I was delighted to be able to work with Dr. Stolberg on this research. She has extensive survey research experience. And our aims were to assess whether women can identify the Catholic affiliation, understand the implications, 
and again, create that sample. Um, writing a survey to assess knowledge and awareness is a tricky business. Um, you want to know what they know without telling them. So we developed the survey advised by experts at the University of Chicago Survey Lab who tested and cognitive, um, conducted cognitive interviews with the instrument, and then we fielded it um, to NORC's Amerispeak panel. So the survey starts by collecting respondents' reproductive experiences, which services and healthcare facilities they use and how they make that decision. Then we move into a fictional vignette slightly adjusted from Miriam Giahi's study. We renamed St. Ignatius St. John's to make it simpler and clearer. Um, and to those unfamiliar with saint names like I am, or had been um, until now, uh, <clears throat> I didn't really know how to say Ignatius. I didn't know if people would definitely know that meant a Catholic hospital, and we wanted them to really have the best shot at knowing that was a Catholic hospital without telling them so initially. And um, because we were trying to replicate the real life experience of going to a hospital when you don't look up their religious affiliation. <clears throat> we kept the other one um, named Metropolitan. And then we randomized our group of respondents um, to St. John's or Metropolitan and asked them what services they expected that they could receive along very similar lines. Um, to Dr. Giahi. At the end of the section, we asked them directly if they thought St. John's what, or Metropolitan had a religious affiliation so that we could know, which was also different from Giahi's study where it was sort of inferred. And so um, we wanted to be able to see if, you know, what would be predictors of getting it right. <clears throat> In our third segment of the survey, we asked questions to gauge their preferences around religious policies for care, sort of opinion questions. But we didn't want to bias them, so we left them all to the end. Um, and we waited until this point to ask if the hospital they mentioned earlier in the survey had a religious affiliation. And if so, what? So 1,430 pe people took the survey. Let's see what we found. Um, so just to start, this was our um, write-in question. We asked them, thinking about where you live currently, if you needed an OBGYN or, or you need reproductive care at a hospital, what hospital would you be more likely to go to? And then had them write it in, the hospital name, the location, the city, and the system, if they knew it. We then checked responses with a rigorously researched current list of hospitals um, governed by the Catholic directives. And the list is compiled by a nonprofit organization called Merger Watch that tracks Catholic healthcare growth, um, among, other, among other things. We used their list because it includes hospitals that have been sold, like I told you before, to non-Catholic entities. They might not be a member of the Catholic Health Association, or they might not have a listing as a religious institution in the um, Medicaid logs, but we, um, know that, or Merger Watch did the research to find out if they're still being run according to the directives. Do they still, are they still governed by Catholic doctrine? So these are non-weighted responses and we found that 17% of our sample named a Catholic hospital as a place they'd be most likely to go for care, which is very fitting. That's close to the percentage of um, hospitals in the U.S. that are Catholic. Um, and so we also asked why they chose that hospital in particular. Um, we asked everyone, of course, about their primary hospital. And while they could check all that apply, we followed up by asking them what was the most important reason. And you can see what we found, um, the most important reason, I mean, most common important reason was quality and reputation. Second, insurance. Third, the particular doctor works there. Um, fourth, location fifth specialty, and religion of the hospital was less than 1% as the most important reason. Um, although 13% or so of the respondents did indicate it was a reason um, when they were able to check as many as they wanted. When asked if people had other hospital options, many responded that they had no reasonable choice based on um, cost or insurance or distance. So about 34% on cost insurance, 31 on distance. Interestingly, that number goes up for the 
respondents who t said their primary hospital is Catholic. So now we're going to move to part two of the survey. And this is where we replicated Giahi's vignette with some minor changes. And um, our vignette read, imagine a woman just moved to a state. She learns about a local hospital called St. John's or Metropolitan. She needs a pap smear, so she makes an appointment to see her OBGYN, who works at St. John's Metropolitan, um, and it, it, to see them in their women's health clinic. And then we remind them, answer each item, remembering this is about a hospital and clinic named whatever in another state, not any hospital you know by that name. So um, part of why Giahi's team had chosen Ignatius was there aren't that many hospitals named Ignatius, so they wanted to make sure people weren't biased by their own experience at a hospital, but we decided to go with St. John's as a very common name to make sure they truly knew it was Catholic, well, they had the best shot at knowing it was Catholic, um, and, and, that, and asked them to make that, that observation themselves. So we asked them some outpatient-related questions first, you know, would you expect your OBGYN to prescribe birth control pills, advise you about natural family planning, and a long list of services, and then we asked we actually continue the vignette. The woman likes the doctor and clinic and decides to continue there as a patient. Um, and then we ask a series of questions pertaining to hospital care. If the pa and today I'm just going to talk to you about this one because again, it's early in the analysis. Um, if the patient wanted or needed it, would you expect St. John's or Metropolitan OBGYN to perform a tubal ligation? Okay. Um, just to give you a sense that the survey also talks about, um, asks about abortion in a variety of circumstances, asks about infertility treatment, miscarriage management, um, prenatal care, birth, a mix of reproductive services. Um, so we found 60, okay, among women who correctly identified St. John's as Catholic, 67% of the women thought they could get a tubal ligation there. When we did an analysis of anything predicted, this um, age, religion, education, and region were not predictive. Um, so being Catholic was not predictive. It might be some sort of hard for people to understand that a Catholic woman wouldn't know that St. John's wouldn't provide these services, but this is where the qualitative data is somewhat illustrative. For example, I interviewed a Catholic woman who tried to get a tubal ligation from her um, urban Catholic hospital, and she explained, when I was going to get my tubal ligation, get my tubes tied, I called another hospital. It was a Catholic hospital in a northeastern city. I grew up in that face, so it was kind of a connection for me, you know what I mean? I figured a tubal ligation, that's not terminating a pregnancy. It's nothing to be frowned upon. Surprise to me, it was. So in this, you can hear that she understood that the, cath the hospital was Catholic and that a Catholic hospital might restrict abortion, but she didn't have any idea of the broader reproductive policies, specifically that, this, that a sterilization procedure would also be restricted. Interestingly, it was the Catholicness of the hospital that drew her, that fami familiar connection. In another interview, I spoke with a young transgender man who had scheduled a hysterectomy with his mother's trusted physician. Like the previous patient, he was going with what was familiar. But the case was abruptly canceled due to the religious policies. The patient was unclear this could become an issue until it was. He detailed an interaction he had with the pre-op nurse who had called to give him instructions. The nurse asked which procedure he was having why he was doing it, and even after explaining that it was a gender reassignment surgery, she wanted to know why. He felt the conversation was awkward and too personal. His doctor didn't anticipate it would be a problem. He just didn't view the hysterectomy as a prohibited sterilization because the patient had already had his breasts removed and had been living for a man as, for a long time, had been taking hormones with no intention of ever bearing children. While one might assume the objection was related to the transgender aspect of the surgery, that's not technically the problem in the directives per se. 
So I asked him after he told me his story, and did anyone at, uh, mention that that hospital in your city that your doctor usually goes to was Catholic? Was that a concern or a consideration? And the patient said, I actually didn't think about it. After my doctor called me to let me know what the hospital had said about the surgery was when I thought, oh, this hospital's called, and then he listed a vaguely Catholic name, which is a Catholic hospital. I didn't think about the whole religious aspect of it. I had no idea. It just kind of dawned on me when he called to let me know that the nuns at the hospital had rejected my procedure. So the rejection was not a technical one. I mean, I'm sorry, it was a very technical one. Sterilization wasn't allowed, period. The doctor rescheduled the surgery in a non-Catholic hospital not too far away and was able to complete it. The next patient story I want to share is a bit longer, and um, it displays significant confusion um, around the religious policies. I spoke to a woman in the Southwest with two kids already, and she was living in a homeless shelter due to domestic violence. She tried to get an abortion from a Catholic hospital. She went there because her friend told her they were very helpful with finances, finances when you're uninsured. They said um, that the friend said that she could get set up with Medicaid there. They could help you finance the care. However, her friend didn't go for an abortion. She recounted, I was wanting to get a, an abortion and they really didn't want to do it. I mean, I guess they performed them there before from what I've heard, but I had got, because I'd gotten a referral there through another lady, but you know, they wanted me to look into adoption and you know, saying that there are families who can't have children and that I should meet with someone, so I did and stuff, but I really didn't want that. If I was further along, I would have considered adoption, but I was only like a couple of weeks. So they did ultrasounds and had her meet with adoption counselors. She came back for four different visits. The whole time, pretty sure she wanted an abortion. But she thought this was what she had to go through first. She didn't exactly understand that because the hospital was Catholic, they would never provide the abortion no matter what. If she had, she said she wouldn't have gone to four appointments. She said, I don't want to have like just some kid floating around out there that I never get to see or why'd you abandon me? And I was wondering like, what if, because I've been sexually abused and when I was younger, so like you can have issues, you know? Like if you just kind of abandon it, you know, and you don't know how life is going to turn out and stuff. So as you can see, she's dealing with a lot. She's homeless, she's experiencing domestic violence, and she has a history of sexual abuse. She went on to clarify that the pregnancy was not intended. She'd been relying on condoms because they had no health insurance for birth control. She thought, of, she thought all of the appointments and counseling um, was a process that preceded the abortion or that would perhaps earn her access to the abortion. She continued, it seemed like if I was gonna do the abortion that like I should have at least gone through the step that they wanted me to if that's the conclusion we were going to come to at the end. They would talk and talk and talk and the baby's just getting bigger and it just kept feeling more wrong, you know, like they were looking for a certain outcome and just didn't think we were having, a, and I just didn't think we were having a meeting of the minds of what I really felt was right for me. When she finally determined they were never going to provide or help her get the abortion anyway, she found Planned Parenthood. She dreaded going there because she knew about the protests outside the clinics and didn't feel safe. Once there, the Planned Parenthood counselors told her about financial resources she could get if she wanted to have the baby, but she decided she needed to terminate for reasons beyond her own poverty. Toward the end of the interview, I pressed her a little to try to clarify her level of understanding of the religious policies of the hospital. I asked, okay, when you were calling the Catholic hospital because your friend said you should go there, did you know at the time that it was Catholic? The patient said, no, I didn't. Well, I might have thought it was kind of a little bit because of the saint being in the name, but then sometimes they just use that because they're hospitals, of course, you know, they, so they want people to feel safe. Okay. So for this patient, the religious hospital name meant we want you to feel safe here. It didn't necessarily mean to her, you won't get an abortion here. So from here, I want to take us back to the survey data, away from Storyland. Um, 
and we were able to quantify the awareness of religious policies in a second way beyond the St. John's vignette. In part three of the survey, we asked all respondents whether their primary hospital that they had written into question two of the survey had a religious affiliation and what it was. We delayed the question until after the vignette because we didn't want to bias it. So we broke out the 17% of the people whose primary hospital is Catholic, and we found that only 65% of them knew that it was Catholic. The other 35% didn't know. Most of them thought it was secular. So then we moved from there to assessing preferences. And we learned something interesting about how you ask preference questions about religious restrictions. Um, so first we asked them, how important is it for you to know what the hospital's religion is when making decisions about where to get care? And 11% said very important, 24% said somewhat important, so about a third. Then we asked, by giving them first a little information, some hospitals restrict some OBGYN and reproductive care because of the hospital's religion. How important is it to you to know what care is restricted before you decide where to get care? And that changed things. Then it was 52% very important, 28% somewhat important. So letting them know that some care is religiously restricted really changed their interest in the religiosity of the hospital. Much like my qualitative interviews, I'm guessing some of them thought the religion wasn't about the, the actual care. It was about feeling safe. It was about being inviting. I mean, in terms of policies. So um, toward the end of the interviews, um, we would ask patients questions to assess their opinions. Um, I'm going back to the qualitative again, their opinions of religious policies and, relig and religious health care if they hadn't already made them clear. And I found that while patients might have been surprised that certain services weren't offered, um, they tended to be more surprised um, about things like denial of contraception or serialization than abortion, which isn't terribly surprising. Um, given the intense stigma and controversy around abortion and how highly segregated abortion is from most other um, medical care. One patient said, it's not them that's gonna have to raise the baby or, you know, I mean, I can see them not wanting to do an abortion, but if you, have to, if you want to have birth control or female sterilization or male sterilization, that should be a choice that's readily available to you no matter what kind of facility you're in. And another said, I don't feel like they, a hospital that has religious beliefs, should be able to dictate what services they provide based off their religious beliefs because I'm in need of your care. That doesn't mean that I have to believe what you believe in order to be helped, in order to be cared for. If it has something to do with how the hospitals represent themselves publicly, I completely understand that. That's your funding. That's all of that. I completely understand that. But how you treat people and how you care for the patients, it shouldn't have anything to do with that. This patient seems to highlight the idea of the fiduciary relationship of the healthcare providers. She indicates that she expected the religion of the hospital to be more of an image than a doctrine, something to help raise money, but that fundamentally healthcare providers shouldn't deny services. She also captures how patients don't really anticipate that hospitals differ, that they could restrict uh, um, based on religion at all. There was a certain uniformity in options expected as a duty or an obligation to patients if the hospital was open to the public. So in summary, a third of US women cannot identify their own hospitals, sorry, Catholic hospitals affiliation. The majority of US women of reproductive age do not know about Catholic hospital restrictions. 
and qualitative findings suggest women assume a, some type of duty to provide full scope care. The vast majority of women want to know about religious restrictions before they decide to seek care. So this research brings up many questions about how awareness, autonomy, informed consent, and access to reproductive health care relate to each other. How can patients have autonomy in this context without information? At what stage do patients need to be informed? Should facility policies be able to limit information to what they consider morally legitimate options? Or should it be all options? Catholic health care um, leaders have at times responded to their critics. One response I want to share with you is from Ron Hamill, a senior ethicist at the Catholic um, Health Care Association. He wrote this article. Um, is it going to show up? Oh, there it is. OK. Um, about early pregnancy complications in which he directly addressed our research on the topic and the ACLU's lawsuits on behalf of women who had been denied timely miscarriage management at Catholic hospitals. In the article, he gave um, detailed instructions and interpretation of church teachings in, re um, in regard to ectopic pregnancy and pregnancy loss scenarios, basically explaining how um, and why the directives uh, work as they do and not suggesting other practices. But what interested me most was his attention to informed consent. He argued to readers that Catholic directors encourage informing patients so that she has a full she has full medical and moral information to inform her conscience while recognizing that not all will agree with his perspective within Catholic health care. He says, while some will disagree, the full disclosure of medically appropriate and indicated options Factually relevant information, including direct abortion, in difficult obstetrical situations can and should occur with, within certain parameters. Interestingly, he adds, for the sake of trust in Catholic health care, if physicians in Catholic hospitals were to routinely and systematically refrain from disclosing factually relevant information, to what extent would that weaken the trust of patients? I'm sorry, the trust patients have in them and the healthcare professionals that practice in Catholic facilities. So while Hamill addresses here the issue of informing women of options that might not be available in, ca in a Catholic hospital, specifically induction of labor or DNE before the fetus has died during a miscarriage, um, he doesn't directly address the upstream question, that is, if a woman knew that a hospital was Catholic, or even more specifically, that her options were restricted in a Catholic hospital, would she go there at all? <clears throat> Still, I appreciate his willingness to open the discussion within his field and community about Catholic healthcare, how it could be more transparent. So I really want to thank the McLean Center and the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and CI3, and especially Julie Kaur for bringing me here um, and organizing this talk. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to open this up to questions. Lucy, I see your hand waving. <laughs> Lady in the red jacket. Um, I just wanted to ask, were you, in the selection of the name, were you trying to pick one that was polar or like kind of, you know, mixed or unclear in the, like it's just selecting St. John's? We tried to be very clear. We were hoping to be very clear. Um, did we achieve that? <laughs> As a Catholic. No, I mean, I think that... Um, I don't know. I'd be inter I can't remember whether you said what percentage recognized or reported St. John's as Catholic versus what you saw with like their own hospitals because okay. um, like St. Ignatius is a very like only Catholic saint. Uh huh. You know, I, in, oh, in terms of my understanding versus like 
<laughs> other, <laughs> like St. John could be Lutheran, could be Episcopalian, or the, I mean, not now the saint, it was one person, but it could be interpreted as some other kind of Protestant. We gave so much thought to this question, you would not believe it, but we didn't think of that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were really, um, we, yeah, we were, um, really thinking about people who didn't know anything about Catholicism and whether they would recognize the name Ignatius, which I know in Chicago probably seems really silly, but I am from California and I've never seen that word. Um, and so I, I just thought, well, I want someone to just be completely, I mean, Debbie and I, so then Debbie and I searched that, sorry, Dr. Stolberg and I scoured the internet for um, Saint, Catholic saint names that were not overly used in Catholic hospitals so that you know they, people wouldn't confuse it with their own care and then we reverted back to let's pick a very common saint extremely common but that's that but could it, be the problem I, well it could be I guess if you were Catholic and you yeah. knew a lot about Catholicism that's interesting but what was the percentage that recognized it with <laughs> that versus <laughs> We didn't include Because it was 65% for their own, right? I'm happy to say it's 85% of the people who were randomized to St. John's identified as Catholic. Yeah. Because they were Catholic. Yeah. Okay. Good. That wasn't okay. in here. Okay. Just looking at those who said, we asked after when you were answering this question, did you think of this hospital as? Okay. And, and the 60 that you're remembering, it was 67% didn't, 67% uh, thought that they could get a tubal. 67% of the people of that 85% who knew it was Catholic, they knew, that population knew it was Catholic. So I think we kind of dealt with it okay, because if 85% definitely got that it was Catholic, then anything within there is knowing that it was a Catholic hospital. And that was the difference between the um, Yahi study and this one, is that we did um, verify at the end of the vignette what affiliation did you think this hospital was instead of try to guess based on their re responses? If you really wanted to be clear, why didn't you just call it St. John's Catholic Hospital? Well, that's a really good question. This is, and this was the dance we were doing. We were trying to be just as clear as a typical hospital would be. They don't say St. John's Catholic, they say just St. John's Mercy, Providence. So they don't tell, so we were trying to be just as, yeah, just exactly mimicking the experience of someone just walking in. So, so I threw something like this at Debbie last week and I'll, I'll do it again yeah. uh, this week. If I was a Jewish guy who owned a deli, uh -huh. I would feel like it was a restriction of my religious freedom to be forced to serve people pulled pork. Mm -hmm. And just because that's what they wanted or just that's because that's what my employees wanted to serve, mm -hmm. I would still want to have that freedom. Okay. Um, well, that's getting right at the fiduciary question. Is sort of, is healthcare different somehow than a deli is the question. If you get public funding and you're taking up a spot of our healthcare system, is it different? And if, and if a person is in a critical situation, sometimes life and death, sometimes it's just a uh, so I understand a critical that, situation is yeah. different, yeah. But I'm getting public funding as a Catholic institution. I mean, I'm not hiding that I'm a Catholic institution, and still the public is agreeing to fund me. Well, um, this is exactly what we're interested in. Are you hiding it? I mean, the question is, uh, so are you hiding it? Because the, I, like the re there's the research about websites, there's no information on the websites. There's been a lot of name changes. Um, Alexian Brothers became, is it Evita? There's Catholic Healthcare West became Dignity Health. There's a lot of decatholicizing de of the image okay, to be so more generic, but the policies are still written by the bishops. So, so patients may not know that I'm Catholic, but whoever's funding me knows that I'm Catholic. Uh, Okay, so then the question is, what is, what is the, what is the um, duty of our healthcare system to decide where the money goes? Right, and this came up last week too, is maybe Catholic institutions shouldn't be publicly funded. Uh, I, I mean, I think that's a, big, that's a big ask, but it's interest, I mean, it's a big. Uh, 
such a big part of our system at this point. Yeah. Hi. Oh, wow, this is loud. Um, I was just wondering, in the statistic you gave where you said that people who had identified a primary Catholic hospital were less likely to know of a secondary hospital, um, does that correlate with the availability of Catholic hospitals as opposed to secular hospitals? Like, are they more common in uh, rural areas or something? That's a really good question. I cannot say we've done that analysis yet, but that will be one of the things we should control for. Reg well, was reg no, re we haven't controlled for region yet for the access thing, the second choice of a hospital yet. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> I'll add that in. <laughs> I mean, in part, I don't know the answer yet to that question because there's just a, um, we need, we probably just need to know more about where Catholic hospitals are and that, do more background work on that as well as control for region. Thank you for the great presentation. It seems to me there are several layers of ethical questions that are built into this. It seems that this survey most gets at what you just said is kind of the primary. It's more, do Catholic hospitals have bad PR? Are their websites just lousy, or is it, you know, is it an active kind of thing? I mean, having worked with a, a lot of websites at hospitals, my general presumption would be no, they're in fact just lousy. I mean, and and you know, ours right here says inaccurate things about what I do, and so it it seems to me that wouldn't have to and then apply intentionality. You'd have to do a different kind of thing to look to see, and, and again, it, it is plausible a hypothesis that in fact for market share, for other reasons, they have done that. And, and again, that might be different within the institution. There may be a marketing team that's doing that where the directives people mm -hmm. have no idea, you know, they're like, oh, they got another member, we changed our name again. You know, I mean, it, it would seem to, as an ethicist, that would be important. Mm -hmm. That if the, the marketing people are doing it to trick people you know, for ethical reasons or just to get market share, that would be, it seems to me, an important question fr from the institutional point of view. And I think that you're touching on, on an important tension within Catholic healthcare right now and probably for the last couple decades is, you know, in this um, really period of really high growth and fierce competition, honestly, um, there are the market-minded people running Catholic healthcare, and then there are the mission-minded people running Catholic healthcare, and they're not always on the same, they don't always have the same agenda. And so I do think there is some tension and some um, disagreement there. And that's true at a lot of institutions, I mean, not, not yeah. just Catholic ones, that the, yeah. I mean, in this institution, and you just talk about trauma center, which we won't, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, like, you could, you could have that same kind of, you know, or if we have midwives deliver, you know, I mean, that kind of thing is inherent to all hospitals and institutions, mm -hmm. it seems to me. The, the other thing about that that I wondered specifically is, do you have numbers about those who knew it was a Catholic hospital and could distinguish and say, yeah, they don't do abortions, we know that, but then didn't know about the tubal, because you just, you, We'll have those numbers. Yeah, because that would be an interesting question. Yeah. If is it, if there's a big difference between those two, that means right. the the Catholic PR about abortion is good. <laughs> it's just not about contraception. <laughs> right. If, if that makes sense. Right. No, it does. Thank you. We will have those numbers. I'm sort of jumping off of Peter's question. I, I do think intent matters when it comes to the way the hospital is portraying itself, but it's not the only thing that matters. I mean, I, I think part of what um, Lori's talk emphasizes is if it is true that um, the average woman facing the average circumstances or even looking at sort of a normal range of circumstances in picking where you go for health care, um, doesn't a doesn't have choices so back to your point about you know is it rural location or distance or insurance restrictions um or has restricted choices or frankly just restricted time mm -hmm. to make a choice right like you're taking time off work and you need to go get a new OBGYN who's going to write your prescription for the pill and it's kind of frustrating to show up to one that you thought you were going to get that and you don't so any of those circumstances then I think the question that's equally interesting to intent is whose responsibility right. and what, to what extent 
do we hold the public responsible for digging really hard to find more information? To what extent do we hold the hospitals responsible? Should there be a third party whose job it is to dis, you know, distribute the unbiased information that everybody can access? I mean, that, that to me is kind of the next step down of what do we do about it. Mm -hmm. Hi, Lori. Um, I know that your research and Dr. Stilberg's research is focusing on reproductive health, but I'm just curious if you know of other research that's being done about other healthcare practices that are religiously driven. Just to count that into that it's the practice of the care and not necessarily mm -hmm. always the marketing, but sort of that intent question. But is there any other research being done about end of life care or any other practices that might be also different because of the religious affiliation? You know, the primary ethical issue that I'm aware of be outside of the reproductive health issues is end of life care, like you mentioned. And I um, am not aware of um, current research. Are you done? Uh, can't think of something, even though it comes up always. I've done a little bit of interviewing about it. Um, it comes up quite regularly. Huh? Psychiatric care. Yeah. There are a few end of life questions, I think, in the Curlin survey, the large survey, um, but I haven't seen much. More related to the physician. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, the physician experience right. of it. Right. Yeah, conflict and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but it, I do think it'd be a rich area of research. Um, it's a little, yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether. Um, how, how rich the area of research would be because I don't know if it's more, um, I don't know how the problem of not having one's advanced directives to not want food and water, that's what we're talking about. They, in 2005, they added a directive saying, if a person says, I do not want food and water, they must still give them food and water at the end of life in a Catholic hospital. Um, because it, the bishops um, decided that food and water is sort of like essential, essential life prolonging and to take it away would hasten death. Um, so that, that directive happened and there was, there's was there been a lot of interest, I just don't know. And in states where physician aid is now being pulled, that would also be a Yeah, right. Um, so I might, I don't want to key in too much on one specific aspect of a very big topic, but in particular, you know, you, I think it was Ron Hamill was the ethicist you cited at the end. So what he said about informed consent, to my reading, actually directly contradicts one of the ERDs, which says that inform, the, that full, uh, to paraphrase, full options must be given provided they do not contradict Catholic teaching. Right. Um, and so uh, that and the other one that, that I think is interesting in light of con uh, tensions between individual provider conscience and especially um, conscientious provision um, is um, th there's, there's something that, I, again, I'm paraphrasing, but not by much, that says um, uh, it does not offend individual conscience to restrict care that, that is contrary to Catholic teaching. Yeah. Full stop. And, that's... And, so, and so I guess, I guess my question is um, that, to me, either highlights that there is variation in that interpretation, some of which might be um, authoritative and some of which might not be. He's not a bishop, so I would suspect mm -hmm. in the Catholic setting it's not authoritative. Mm -hmm. Or it possibly highlights the fact that people, even very well-intentioned people in the leadership of these institutions don't realize that these are actually problems that patients face. Um, what do you think about that? I think that he's very, I mean, this comes at the end of this incredibly detailed article where he actually itemized my research, Debbie's research, um, the AC specific cases in the, that the ACLU has tried. Um, so he was super, very aware, and then goes through and applies the directives to each case. So I think this is a very aware person, very knowledgeable, and actually I think he was trying to start a conversation and maybe push, push them a little, maybe, maybe this is how things change very, very slowly, is to say, um, look at this idea, this is a legitimate idea, and maybe, well, maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but maybe that will trickle into something. Has there been a response to that? And where was that, like how was that it's published? It's in the prime, it? it was published in a few locations, honestly, but they're all Catholic healthcare journals, primary you know, resources in Catholic healthcare. 
And have there been any like letters to the editor? Any responses that you're that, aware of? None, not that I'm aware of. No. I mean, I, I don't. I, I, did, I actually there may be. I just am not aware. Thanks for a really informative discussion. Um, you mentioned in your agenda that one of the next steps down the road was more provider or physician-based uh, qualitative interviews. I may have missed that, or I think that was there. Ethicist. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Although I, I wouldn't, yeah. I, then I was curious about data that might be available about what I'll term um, sort of the, the, the hidden practices within Catholic institutions uh, that are either provider-driven. Um, the example I remember in training um, was the frequency of hysterectomy as a surrogate for tubal ligation. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering about that. Um, what's the awareness? Has it continued to be a, 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 a real issue? It's clearly not directly related to the doing the sort of the right thing in the context of, of reproductive rights and choice, but I'm just curious about um, what the prevalence might be and if, if anyone's interested in getting at that information. So number one, that is um, something we've done a lot of research in qualitative way about, and Debbie presented some of those findings last week, but they really, really interesting practices around, yeah, um, we'd heard terms like, well, it, these are kind of older, older terms. In the past, people used to say, oh, she has a really tired uterus. Let's take it out. Or let's do it a uterine isolation. And these were like words to not say we're doing a sterilization. And somehow those would fly by OK. And even the physicians we interviewed um, in 2011 and 12, um, a lot of them remember having more permissiveness around tubal ligation. They said, oh, when I took this job 10 years ago, when I took it 15 years ago, people told me I could get these, these approved if there was any health problem, just, you know, anything. And, um, and then, that, then they cracked down on that. And I've been reading a bit of history, and it looks like there really was a movement within, um, just within the Catholic leadership and the bishops to crack down on these excessive tubal ligations. Um, it, it just at the very highest levels, and trickling down through our, through departments, some people saying, oh, our department chair, in our interviews, our department chair came and said, you can't do that anymore. Um, so we, we call them workarounds um, in our data, and we, we, lo we love to sort of look at the different ways that people talk about it. But I think we need to do a survey, because <laughs> you can't get at prevalence in the qualitative studies. Just range. So thank you, Lori. This was really interesting. I love um, that you're looking so closely at what patients know and understand. And my question for you is whether you and Debbie or anybody else that you know of is thinking about figuring out a way to understand what patients understand about um, hospitals that are otherwise secular hospitals but that follow the ERDs because mm -hmm. of some sort of an, a business arrangement or agreement, a purchase agreement or merger agreement with a Catholic healthcare institution. Um, and what do those patients know and how do they understand when you can't use like the name as the proxy for what their experience will be at the hospital? You just gave me a really good idea. Because um, if we look at our list of the 1,200, no, of, of the 213 Catholic hospitals, perhaps we can sort of isol uh, sort of uh, adjust for transparency or sort of create columns of different levels of transparency and see if there's differences, kind of. Is that what you're saying? Because some, some of them probably barely look Catholic at all and don't, are not named so, but still operate. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, right. So you go to your community hospital, you think you can get whatever care, and in the end, they turn you away when you're miscarrying because they follow the ERDs and whoever would have known um, because they're not even a Catholic hospital. Yeah. Yeah, and like the 16% who were seen or where their primary hospital was Catholic and they correctly um, identified that. Did that include the mergers through Merger Watch or just the Catholic hospitals? Correctly identified their hospital included all, that was the master list. That was the, everyone who run, is run by the ERDs, um, whether they're currently owned by a Catholic healthcare okay. network or not. Merger Watch, that's what Merger Watch is. Merger Watch's most yeah. current list. Yeah. Yeah. They really did a lot of work tracking down the hospitals. Um, so. 
this is an awesome data set, so I'm really excited for you guys to do this analysis. Excited awesome. too. It's, it's really, it's really important and good. But um, in terms of like the the fact that you have the you know the it was the merger watch map that showed that in different states there's like like Washington and Alaska mm -hmm. are like approaching half of all hospitals. Um, you have this you know map with different kind of market shares or thresholds of seepage mm -hmm. of, you know, controlled by religious health systems. Do you have any hypotheses or plans to do, like, in terms of whether people's knowledge is also connected to those different levels? Because you do, yeah. it is nationally representative, right? So you could yeah, saturate kind of, yeah, yeah, to see whether it actually makes them, yeah. you know, more knowledgeable or not. Yeah. It's fascinating. To, definitely. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, um, testing it by saturation level. And I think it's interesting, it just happens to be interesting to me about Washington State because I, I don't know what the, the level of the Catholic population is in Washington, but I'm, I'm anticipating it's lower than other places, yet there's higher, maybe I'm wrong, yeah. Yeah, but um, if it's lower and the saturation of Catholic hospital is higher, it'd be interesting to see like versus another place whether Anyway, well, whether in a place like Alaska, I mean, there's yeah. a whole host of other issues that that then creates yeah. because of just the number of the, and access in general. Access, so. absolutely. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I just had a question. It's kind of a specific question, but I was surprised at your finding that. Um, that religion and education were not predictive of whether people knew about the nature of their hospital. And I guess I was just wondering, did you have any qualitative interviews um, where the person hadn't been surprised or had been aware of it? And um, and if there was, if you had any kind of preliminary idea about why that would be, maybe you know, politi political ideology or something like that. What, what were the factors that would make someone more aware? Right. Yeah. Or if it's someone, if someone, if uh, someone wasn't surprised, like you know, who was, was totally aware, and like you know, maybe the, that was at thirty percent or smaller, but who were aware of of the restrictions a Catholic hospital might have. Like, what, what did you do? You think there is any the, kind of predictive for one, that? Well, I'll tell you what's really predictive is working in the hospital. I had a couple people who were like, you know, had some level of employment in the hospital. Didn't mean they knew all of the. The, but the, those are the people who I felt were the most knowledgeable, um, or they worked in healthcare to some extent. They had just a little bit more insight about it. Um, but I don't really, I don't know what the predictors would be, and it, I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't come to mind any real revelations about. I mean, it's, I guess, yeah, some people who had a fair amount of knowledge about Catholicism would definitely anticipate the abortion restriction. And you sort of heard that a little bit. Like, I can understand abortion, but they um, were frequently surprised about other things. So, in the medical model, we rely on the provider to do the informed consent. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to an institutional level like this, the information doesn't necessarily need to come from the religious, religiously affiliated institutions themselves. I mean, Market Watch or um, the Bixby Center or you know anybody could mount a public information campaign to say, you know, uh, your rights are limited if you go to these places. Check our list before you you get health care. Yeah, I mean, maybe I don't know. If Lori wants to speak to the. I mean, there are a lot of different kinds of information campaigns going on. I think that's um, one one approach. And um, this is Lori Chayton from the ACLU, is involved in some levels of information. So I don't. I do know that there is some looking at that sort of thing, and obviously even the work um, that um, Lori and Debbie are doing and others to get the message out there is helpful, but I guess I would turn back to you and ask when the patient comes and isn't aware and isn't given full information about her medical circumstances and treatment options, um, doesn't that undermine um, or violate the ethical obligations that a physician has to a patient to make sure that she is making 
an informed medical decision. So it's not enough for a third party to have the responsibility to say, don't go there, because in the end, they're not going to get to everybody. And in the end, we know that patients do go there. They don't know the limitations. And they are sent away without full information of the kind that hopefully they would be getting, for example, here at the University of Chicago. Or they don't necessarily have a choice. Yeah. Right. Um, so, you know, for those women who have this one institution and now they know that they, you know, that these options are restricted um, or some options may re be restricted, mm -hmm. um, but there isn't necessarily a transparent discussion at the doctor patient. So, I, I, j just for clarification, are you saying that it, it shouldn't, like, the, the physician doesn't have to have a, a, does not have a responsibility to, review all these options, or I, I'm just a little confused. Are you saying that the provider shouldn't be responsible for having some full I, disclosure? I think, you know, ideally the provider would, but if it's a matter of, you know, what's the most cost-effective way of getting a result? It might be more cost-effective to put a list of Catholic hospitals on buses that are going around the city than to try to convince St. Ignatius to really disclose, you know, uh, you know what they do and the, the restrictions they put on their providers. Maybe you do want to talk about that, though, because aren't you kind of working on a disclosure? <laughs> well, yeah, you want to talk about the disclosure thing? Or did the, this, um, yeah, I mean, the disclosure law and what happens yeah, with Yeah, I mean, but the law, the law that passed has to do with um, what a healthcare provider, institutional or individual, because that's how the law, de Illinois law defines healthcare provider, has to ensure that the patient knows. And so, it, again, I think you're, this isn't a bad idea that you're suggesting, but I don't think it's a foolproof idea. And I think that there are patients who, you know, will go anyway. I think that Julie's comment about having not having a choice, there are people who's the only hospital in their community is one that lives under the restrictions, whether it's because it's a Catholic hospital or because it's a secular hospital that follows the ERDs. People's insurance networks limit them. There are all yeah. kinds of limitations. And so unless you happen to see the sign on the bus and then made your decision about what insurance to get that maybe your employer offers, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's complicated. And ultimately, we trust our health care providers to give us information and to um, have our best interests at heart when we come there for care. So. Two in the back. Um, really enjoy your talk. I, I guess I was just wondering, the ERD seemed to be sort of the sticking point in terms of uh, the root cause of the limitations on care, and those you said came from the, the bishops. Has there been any change as a result of Pope Francis's work in terms of uh, creating maybe a more liberal Catholic interpretation? A short answer, I don't know of any change. Anybody else know of any change? I mean, maybe these things take time, or maybe there won't be any change. Right, because it's also written by the American bishops. Yeah. And I don't know how. I don't even. I don't know, know on the ground like how much of the you know how much the change at the top sways the change at that level. It's hard or, to know. Or whether I mean there was a lot of controversy in the initially they that the U.S. bishops were not very pleased with the liberalization in Pope Francis's way of speaking about maybe we shouldn't focus on abortion so much. So I don't know whether they're on the same page or not. I mean, I'm sure technically they are, but I mean, not technically, or officially they are. Um, but I don't know, if, you know. But this is definitely out of my wheelhouse, honestly. Um, <laughs> me a little more theologian in the room. Um, so one of the things that our institution sort of has a pulse on right now is being a trauma center. Mm -hmm. Are there any restrictions about whether a Catholic affiliated hospital or Catholic hospital can be a level one or two trauma center. I just don't know if there's any policies about this. Because I can imagine if a woman is hemorrhaging from a miscarriage and she calls 911 and the ambulance brings her to a trauma center, if that trauma center happens to be Catholic, but is there any, are there restrictions about this? Well, let, let me trauma. clarify. If there's trauma, then they can do it. Oh. So, so if she has her life if her life is threatened um, by hemorrhage, then the ethics committee would approve it quickly. 
I think, unless there was a malpractice problem or though, a bad interpretation. Though the interpretation of that yeah. period, I mean, we've had a case where um, we cared for a woman who was at another Catholic institution uh -huh. um, who was hemorrhaging, oh, okay. um, and she had to be eventually transferred here. So I think that there's there a lot of room for interpretation because there was cardiac activity. And this gets back to Debbie's question of responsibility because there, the bad cases that we hear about in the news, sometimes if you really look closely, they could have treated, but they didn't interpret correctly. So then whose responsibility is it to improve the interpretation part? Because the bishops issue the directives, then you have the ethics committees implementing, and then you've got the doctors below them trying to make quick decisions with ethics committees' approval, and there's just room for human error slash, uh, well, of course, there's always room for human error, but, um, but you know, there's room for, I guess, misinterpretation. And I would say also the issue with the trauma centers you know, then the, the challenge is in regions that would otherwise not have a trauma center um, right. to withhold having a trauma center. I mean, it, there's so many, you know, it gets very, very dicey um, uh, because then that also becomes a, it's like a justice issue against a justice issue. So it becomes quite challenging. And then there's the whose responsibility is it and is it, do you go up one higher? I mean, is there a way that the U.S government has a role in ensuring um, equal access. Sorry. Yeah. Going back to Bob, your question um, about sort of who do we expect to do the informing, um, I, I sometimes feel like we in the reproductive health world need to acknowledge that when we get obsessed about access to reproductive health care, we need to start from the standpoint that access to, re to health care in our country is not so great, is not guaranteed. We don't have um, the right to information about how to get good health care anywhere. So in a lot of ways, I think what we're asking is, um, do we expect access to contraception, abortion, sterilization to be as bad as everything else, or is it okay that it's worse? And is it worse? Um, because I think, uh, and again, acknowledging that we may be holding to some hypothetical standard that just doesn't exist in our country, I do think there's a real role as well for stigma and the public attitude that if women have to work harder for these services, that's kind of that's kind of normal, that's kind of okay, that these are, these are sort of separate things that you kind of have to work a little harder to find. And so, I mean, again, I don't, yes, we are, are we are advocating for good public information, um, but I think that's in a, backdrop of already sort of uh, higher barriers. I think the access question is, is huge, but a lot harder than just the awareness question. 